Okay, so good morning everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much to Joy and to Mauro, the organizers, uh, for inviting me today. It's a pleasure for me to talk to you about the dynamics of open quantum systems. I've heard that this is quite an informal uh, set, uh, so please, please interrupt me when there is something you want to ask or you don't understand, and I'll be happy to, to, to try to, to, to put more details into my explanations. Um, this is a kind of an introductory talk or course, um, therefore I'm gonna kind of touch a lot of different uh, realms where open quantum systems appear and and uh, the main aspects uh, of their study. Um, and I will not go into depth into any particular example, so it will be about the theory of open quantum systems. But I'm very happy, of course, again, to, uh, to be interrupted, so. Okay, so, oh, let's see if I can. Uh, before starting, I would like to thank all this bunch of people with whom I've had the pleasure to collaborate or to discuss um, extensively during, during my research years. And also I'd like to thank uh, these people that uh, are master students uh, from last year and from this year in my group, and to Carlos Parra, who is now a postdoc in my group coming from Colombia. And uh, well, they are really, um, I would say, responsible of uh, the best ideas I can teach to you today. Uh, thanks to them, I've been able to learn a lot. Um, okay, so before starting, what are the questions that come to our mind when we think about open quantum systems? So open quantum systems are quantum mechanical systems that are coupled to some environment, uh, and therefore some of you may have heard of uh, the word decoherence, defacing. Decoherence has to do with the loss of superpositions in the eigenstates of the quantum mechanical systems, and uh, dissipation has to do with the loss of energies. Uh, uh, from the system into the environment. And then we have a set of questions, like for instance, um, if we couple an open system to a reservoir, to an environment that is in a thermal equilibrium, does it always thermalize or not? And then for instance, uh, we may ask, uh, where is irreversibility coming from? Because after all, when we think about a quantum mechanical system, it's described with unitary evolution equations, with a Schrodinger equation or von Neumann equation, uh, which are uh, reversible completely. So where, where is irreversibility coming from? And then we went uh, to address the question of when we think about, uh, uh, for instance, a superconducting qubit, and uh, we say, oh, it's a noisy device. It's a noisy open, uh, it's, a, it's an open system that is affected by a noise. So what is the microscopic origin of such a noise? These are the questions we are going to, to address today. This is the guide. Of, of the talk, so it's kind of uh, composed of eight blocks. Uh, the talk is uh, all together around three hours. Uh, we will make pauses <laughs> in the middle. Um, well, I will start with very, very general ideas. Uh, what is an open quantum system? What is this uh, dynamical map? So I will uh, teach you uh, hopefully what a map is uh, to those of you that are not familiar. And then I will go through microscopic modeling of both the quantum mechanical system and the reservoir. And then I will uh, discuss statistical properties of the environment. I will also discuss the weak coupling and the Markov limit, which are the most important ones to deal with open quantum systems. Uh, then we will touch briefly what happens in the non-Markovian limit. I will explain why these fuzzy words are meaning for those of you that are not familiar. And then we will see what happens when we want to actually tackle the full system plus environment dynamics, which is kind of a huge problem, as you will see. And finally, we will revisit the microscopic modeling because, as it turns out, the simple models that we will be touching in the third point of the talk are not uh, quite good to cover all the physical uh, um, instances where we find uh, open quantum systems. Okay, of course an open quantum system can be a molecule or an atom or a, well, you name it, or a cavity mode or a set of them that, uh, well, in principle, you know, in the origins of the theory of quantum mechanics, people were saying, okay, let's um, consider that this quantum system is isolated and is described entirely by this Schrodinger equation, which depends on the Hamiltonian of the system. 
But um, as it turns out, in, um, in real setups, what we find is that uh, quantum mechanical systems are coupled to environment. Like for instance, when you think about atoms, uh, they are usually interacting with the electromagnetic field as a result of which they are emitting photons or absorbing photons. Then you may think about this kind of uh, quantum Brownian motion setup in which you have a, um, a massive particle that is moving in a solvent, in a fluid, for instance. And it's been affected by the collisions of the surrounding smaller molecules. And then you may think about also an electron that is in a lattice and is actually coupled to the phononic vibrations of the lattice. And there you can uh, again think about the, the electron as the open quantum system and the phononic field as uh, the environment affecting uh, the motion of the electron in the lattice. Another example of, uh, of an open quantum system is when you think about, for instance, in a biological system, uh, in, a, in a quantum photosynthetic uh, complex, you may think about uh, an open system composed of antenna molecules that are receiving the light from the sun, and they are actually uh, transporting this energy from one antenna molecule to the other, but as it turns out, this whole transport process is occurring in the presence of uh, vibrations of the surrounding proteins. So it's kind of affected by an environment of phonons, just as in the case of uh, the phonons of a lattice. And then what it means is that we have to consider a Hamiltonian that not only includes the open system, but also the environment and some interaction part. And as a result of this, what it turns out is that we have to consider a Schrodinger equation for the full uh, wave function that includes both the open system and the environment. And the bad news is that this guy here, this wave function, is living in a Hilbert space that is huge because it's kind of growing exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom in both the system and the environment. And remember that the environment can be very, very huge. And this is a problem because, um, well, you know, uh, we cannot compute the dynamics of such wave function um, in our laptops today or in big computers uh, when we want to include the whole Hilbert space. But we will see later on that there are tricks to do that uh, by using uh, what is called matrix product states. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, the interesting thing is that actually we are only interested about the reduced dynamics of the open quantum system. We are only interested about what is going on with the uh, degrees of freedom of the quantum open system. And the quantum mean values of the open quantum system can be very, very nicely described with this object that is called the reduced density matrix of the open quantum system, which is nothing but a trace over the bath or the environment degrees of freedom of this uh, projector of the total wave function. So this is an object where we have already traced out the environment degrees of freedom, but we are taking them into account. It's not that we are forgetting about them, but we are taking them into account in the sense that this object will correctly describe the effects of the environment, namely the, the coherence and the dissipation. So the whole idea of the theory of open quantum systems is to be able to actually from the whole Hilbert space describe the reduced dynamics of the open quantum system in its reduced Hilbert space. So we want to obtain uh, evolution equations of the open quantum system within its small Hilbert space, which can be, for instance, the Hilbert space of a qubit or a bunch of qubits. And this is, of course, a much smaller uh, mathematical space than that, th which is including also their environment. And the key idea here is that we want to consider the environment, but, by, but only by taking into account its statistical properties. And this is something we will also um, be dealing with in, in the next few minutes. Okay, so let me go to the second uh, part, which is to describe this uh, dynamical map. So let me um, um, imagine that we have an initial state for the system and the environment, which is uh, the correlated state. So there are no correlations between the system and the environment initially. 
This is a type of state that we can certainly prepare. And it is also mostly, um, well, a very frequent situation that the environment is in an equilibrium state. What does it mean an equilibrium state mathematically is that it can be written as a sum of projectors over its eigenstates. This is an example of equilibrium state, for instance, is a Gibbs state, a thermal state, in which case these lambdas depend on the temperature, are the, uh, the thermal weights of, of the environment state. Okay, so then um, we can actually, uh, mathematically, without making any approximation, rewrite the reduced density matrix in terms of this quantity here, which is what I'm going to be calling a dynamical map. This dynamical map is actually kind of a propagator because it's propagating the initial state of the system, the initial reduced density matrix, in time. So it's actually a very, very key object to describe the dynamics of the open system. And as a matter of fact, it comes in terms of these Krauss operators, just to connect with uh, the terminology that some of, some of you may know, which are matrix elements between uh, the environment eigenstates of the evolution operator with respect to both the system and the environment. And this object is kind of key in the theory of open quantum systems. It has many different properties, which I'm going to discuss very briefly because um, they also connect with the physics behind these uh, systems. So in detail, for instance, uh, it is an object that will describe uh, very nicely uh, the fact that open quantum systems are irreversible. But on the other hand, I would like to also mention that this map in general is invertible. So you may tell me, okay, if this is invertible, um, then mathematically I can always uh, reach back the initial state by simply applying the inverse of the map. Since it's invertible, that should be fine. But the point is that uh, this inverse of the map is not a universal dynamical map. It's not a map itself. And this is what irreversible means. So but what does it physically mean is that we cannot fabricate a weird environment that have as a universal dynamical map psi t minus one, such that it can return me to the initial state. So this is what irreversible mean. And as it turns out, I can only do that when um, actually the open quantum system is a closed system. So actually when the map is just the unitary. So only in this case, not only you have an inverse of the map, but also this inverse of the map is a map, namely the unitary evolution operator. If you have an open quantum system and, and this map is uh, not a unitary evolution operator, then the inverse of the map is not a map. And this is what uh, it means to have an irreversible evolution. Okay, so another um, property which I'm not going to be talking about is the fact that you can write the map in different uh, representations. Uh, you can write it in terms of what is called a Choi matrix. Um, uh, and you can write it in terms of uh, many different uh, um, um, operator bases for the open system, but this is kind of more mathematical uh, mathematically oriented and today we don't have time for that. But what is important is that mathematically from this map we can show that a time local master equation emerges. And what does it mean is the following. So a master equation is an evolution equation for the reduced density matrix of the system, okay? And now if the inverse of the map exists, we can always write such an equation simply by uh, deriving the, the map and applying the inverse of the map, this would be psi zero. Okay, and what is interesting is that one can, by simply using the properties of hermeticity and trace preservation, derive mathematically an equation which is uh, having this form, which is a time local master equation for the reduced density matrix of the system. And it turns out that this equation comes in terms of a first term that describes the the, let's say, the free evolution of the system without environment. This would be, um, if you were to have only this uh, term, that would mean that your system is actually independent from the environment, simply evolving according to its Hamiltonian. But now you have this other term that describes the dissipation and the decoherence. And 
this term is quite complex. It has as many components as system transitions, so it really depends on the dimensionality of the open system D. And it, de it depends on these guys here, which are decaying matrices. So these are kind of dissipative rates that are going to uh, describe this, um, this decoherence and dissipation process. And by the way, these quantities here, this G, are operators of the system. Like for instance, if the system is a spin, these guys would be, uh, for instance, the sigma, the Pauli matrices, sigma X, sigma Y, and sigma Z. And well, this is just what I, what I said. And you can actually diagonalize this equation and put it in a Lindblad form. Some of you might have been familiar with, uh, with uh, Lindblad equations. And this pretty much looks like a Lindblad equation where the Lindblad operators are these LKs. But the key point here is that this is a mathematical representation of an exact evolution of a quantum open system. The key point here is that both the decay rates and the Lindblad operators are time dependent. So it's not a Lindblad equation properly where these two guys are time independent, but it has a Lindblad form. And moreover, the, let's say the important question here in the theory is to come up with the actual form of these coefficients and these Lindblad operators. This is a problem that is not solved in general. So you may have some examples in which you can actually know what is the form of these coefficients and these Lindblad operators, but in general, you can only access them once you consider some approximations. And as you will see later, these approximations are related to having a large separation between the system, the open system relaxation time scale and the environment um, time scale of recovering from the interaction with the system. Um, this separation of time scales is related to the weak coupling uh, approximation that we will see later. But the important thing here is that we have this mathematical form, which is very beautiful, because uh, this is telling you, look, um, no matter how uh, complex your environment is, I don't know, because I have not yet told you which environment I'm talking about. What I can tell you is that if its map is invertible, which is a kind of a weak assumption because most of physical maps are invertible, I can tell you that the evolution of the reduced density matrix of the open system will be a time local, will have this particular form. Okay, but what about non-Markovianity measures? Some of you um, may be experts on the topic, I don't know, or some of you may only have heard about non-Markovianity and non-Markovianity measures. And um, I'm gonna say a few words in this respect. I'm gonna focus on non-Markovianity measures that are based on the divisibility of the map. Um, well, I'm gonna change a little bit the notation uh, of the map. Uh, now, instead of putting a sub-index T, I'm going also to refer to the initial time of the map. So this map is going to propagate your state from a time T equal to zero to T. And well, it turns out that the map is said to be divisible and we will see how important this is for applications in the next couple of minutes. If one can really uh, divide or split an evolution from zero to T2 into two pieces from zero to T1 and from T1 to T2, and both pieces are universal dynamical map. This is what this acronym comes from. These two pieces have to be maps, have to have the nice properties of this uh, initial map that we are splitting. Um, by the way, this is a property that is only fulfilled according to, uh, to the proposal of Rivas, Huelgas, uh, and Plenio, it's only fulfilled um, by Markovian evolutions. So it kind of implies, in a sense, a sort of lack of, lack of memory uh, of the environment uh, from uh, the system dynamics. The environment forgets about um, the fact that it has uh, interacted with the system, roughly speaking. But there is a stronger property than divisibility, which is that the map is a dynamical semigroup, and this is the property that is linked to the Lindblad evolutions. And this property is much stronger because it tells you that 
not only the map can be splitted like this, but it can all actually be splitted into these two uh, pieces that, uh, well, that actually have the form of an exponential over a limbladium times t. Um, or let's say for a map to fulfill this divisibility property, it should have this exponential form. And uh, well, as you can see, this is a scheme of what happens along the time when the map is divisible and when it's a semigroup. When the map is divisible, you can really split it, split it into different pieces. Each of, the, each of these pieces can be different with each other. But for a semigroup, each of the, these pieces are going to be the same, are going to be just the exponential of the Limbladian times delta t. So this is a much more convenient type of property when we want to describe uh, an evolution in terms of the, uh, in the case of a semigroup, in, in terms of the sub subsequent application of dynamical maps on the open system of the same map. And this actually connects with um, how useful um, the maps are for, uh, for instance, describing a quantum information protocol. Now imagine that you have a qubit, uh, superconducting qubit, and uh, you want to apply certain, um, certain uh, unitaries on the qubit along the time. At the time t1, you apply one, and at the time t2, you apply another one. And in between, you will have the free evolution of the qubit when coupled to the environment, because the qubit is going to be affected by a certain environment. And these unitaries are those ones in the middle. These ones are going to be unitaries with the full Hamiltonian, which also includes the environment. And now what do you want to see is what is the uh, reduced density um, operator conditioned to the application of all these unitaries and considering the environment. And what we know is that if the map is divisible, uh, namely the environment is Markovian in the sense of Rivas, Huelga, and Plenio, um, then we know that each of these pieces will be a well-defined map. So you can actually, uh, well, I, I kind of skip a part of the explanation, but you can rewrite this trace over the environment of these unitaries in terms of the application of pieces of the map uh, to the initial state, um, inter, inter wind or, uh, or interrupted by the unitaries over the qubit. So this is a scheme of the time evolution, you will first apply the unitary, then you apply the map, then the unitary, then another map, and so on and so forth. This is what happens when it's divisible. But then um, you may have that the map is uh, even better because it's actually a semigroup. And when it's a semigroup, you know that each of these um, um, map in, maps in the middle are going to be defined through the same Limbladian. And this is what people do in many uh, quantum information protocols that where they want to uh, consider the action of, of the noise or the action of, of the environment is really to consider a particular model for this Limbladian according to some physical process like defacing or bit flip or, or uh, in general unital maps um, and describe uh, the protocol just like this. But this is of course uh, implying some assumptions that we will uh, see later on. So are there any questions so far? No? Okay. This can be bad or good, I don't know. Okay. So, yes, please. Yes, please. A bit slower. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll go a little a bit slower. Okay. So, so far we have seen um, properties of, uh, of the map which, uh, as you can see, is a mathematical object that evolves the initial state of the open quantum system. And so far, we have not made any assumption of how does the environment looks like. So the environment so far is kind of a, a terra incognita. It's something that uh, it's kind of, uh, well, it's a very abstract, uh, um, it's a very abstract object. But, uh, of course, to have a more idea of uh, how does this dynamical map look like, we need to model the environment. We need to have more knowledge of how does the environment look like. And this is the third part of the talk. We are going to make some 
microscopic modeling of our environment. Uh, so we are going to use some Legos. Um, actually, we are going to, um, well, this is, again, what we are going to do is uh, simply to model the Hamiltonian. That describes the interaction between the system and, and the environment. Um, well, that describes the system, the environment, and the interaction pieces. And as you know, the basic building blocks in quantum mechanics are of two types, uh, mainly. Uh, things can get more complicated than this, of course, but uh, in quantum mechanics, you can either have um, systems that are composed by harmonic oscillators that are mathematical objects that describe or that have a, a equi-spaced energy levels. Or you may consider, um, so for instance, molecules or, or atoms that have non-equi-spaced energy spectra, which are described with spin operators. And these are, let's say, our Legos, our building uh, models for, for the environment. Um, in the case of harmonic oscillators, these are described by creation and annihilation operators, whereas uh, spin operators are described with ladder operators. And as it turns out, back in the 60s of the last century, uh, when people were starting to, to think about, uh, well, not starting mainly, that came back from before, but they were really trying to understand um, dissipation, the coherence. So, of course, uh, Feynman and Vernon, uh, I say of course because this guy was, I think, responsible of many of the brilliant ideas that we are today living uh, from. Um, so Feynman was, uh, Vernon were realizing that most of the environments that are affecting, um, that are affecting the evolution of quantum mechanical systems are actually harmonic. They can be described with harmonic oscillators. Um, an example of such type of environment, of course, is the electromagnetic field. There we don't have to make any, any assumption. So the electromagnetic field is simply described as a collection of harmonic oscillators representing the different modes of the electromagnetic field, but also vibrations can be described uh, by, by phonons. And so this idea came back from the, from the 60s and was later developed by Caldera Leggett in the 80s. And then people realized that there is also another universal type of environment or canonical model of environment in which actually the environment is composed by spins and we are not going to talk too much today about them, but there is a very nice review by Prokofiev and Stamp, and they, um, they really have different properties than, than harmonic oscillators environments. And it also um, uh, was concluded that in most cases one can really assume that the interaction Hamiltonian between the system and the environment is a product between some operator of the environment that is describing transitions between the environment eigenstates and some, uh, some uh, um, operator from the system that is also describing some, some operation in the system, some transition in the system. And this is very nice because this means that no matter how complicated your environment is, you can always, or not always, as you will see later, but in many, many, many cases, describe it in particular in terms of harmonic oscillators. And this is what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. Um, so, but let, let me go to, um, back to, to the, these examples that I was mentioning at the beginning, just to mention you that these examples are examples in which we have open systems coupled precisely to harmonic environments, to environments that are composed by a set of independent harmonic oscillators. So in this case, we have the electromagnetic field, as I said before, which is composed by modes uh, corresponding to, to, um, well, to, to different frequencies and, and polarizations of the photons. Um, in this case, you also can um, simulate a solvent as a set of harmonic oscillators. Uh, the vibrations in this case and this case are phononic vibrations, which are also harmonic os oscillators of, or can be described as harmonic oscillators of bosonic type. Okay, so just to give you a flavor of how are these Hamiltonians looking like 
Um, there you see the familiar light matter interaction Hamiltonian, where you can see in particular the idea that I'm talking about. So you have um, the light matter interaction Hamiltonian is composed of a piece that describes uh, the, the, the atoms or the molecules that are interacting with the light. The light or the electromagnetic field, which a particular dispersion relation omega k. BK dagger and BK are the creation and annihilation operators that are going to create and annihilate or annihilate a photon with momentum k. And then you have some interaction piece. So you can see that this Hamiltonian obeys the structure I was talking to you from the beginning. It has some interaction piece where you can have a linear interaction between ladder operators that describe transitions um, between uh, the ground state and the excited state of each of the J atoms, because you may have a collection of J atoms, and uh, the creation of a photon. So you have an interchange of quanta between the electromagnetic field and the atoms, which are, in our case, the open quantum system. And here, in this other model where you have the particle in a solvent, you now, instead of having an open system that is described as a set of two-level systems, uh, in the case of having atoms, you now, have an open, you now have an open system that is described as a particle um, with um, a certain uh, momentum p and a certain position q. So this means that your open quantum system is described by a continuous degrees of freedom, which are position and momentum. And uh, this, um, well, this is the Hamiltonian of the open quantum system of a particle or this heavy particle with a mass m, which is very large, that is moving in a particular potential. And now it's going to be coupled to some, um, to some um, harmonic oscillator environment, where, uh, which is described by some position and uh, some uh, momentum and uh, position operators which can, of course, be described in terms of creation and annihilation operators, right? So this is just another way to uh, write a collection of free or independent harmonic oscillators with a uh, label lambda describing each of them, which is coupled through this particular term to the uh, heavy particle that is moving. And yet we have another example, which is that in which we consider a set of uh, antenna molecules, uh, which have each of them a particular internal level or is described by um, um, some basis state M, which is described, describing the fact that the molecule or the antenna molecule labeled M is excited. So this is a Hamiltonian that is describing the uh, hoping, this is a hoping term of an excitation within these antenna molecules and some, uh, some on-site uh, on energy term. And this, uh, these antenna molecules are going to be coupled again to a field of, in this case, phonons uh, that are described with creation and annihilation operators and by a dispersion relation. And the coupling is again described with this linear combination or this linear um, um, product between um, the antenna molecule uh, ladder operators and some position operator of the phonons. So this is again another example of, of Hamiltonian or situation that uh, lies in the class of Froelich model, bose polaron and quantum transport models. Okay, so I hope by now I have convinced you that in general um, we can write the many different examples of open quantum systems in terms of this general Hamiltonian where you have the open quantum system piece, the environment piece composed of, or which depends on some creation and annihilation operators, and some uh, interaction term that describes uh, the coupling between the system coupling operators and the environment um, creation and annihilation operators. And by the way, the coupling between the system and the environment is tuned or mediated by these coupling strengths that are actually going to describe the coupling between each of the K harmonic oscillators and the open system. 
Um, of course, uh, we can have uh, more than one um, open system, and we can have uh, an index J in the interaction Hamiltonian that runs over, for instance, many different atoms in the case of light matter interaction, or many different molecules in the case of antenna molecules coupled to the vibrations of the proteins around. And uh, in the end, what you will have is a, an interaction term which has the very same structure as before, but just uh, including a uh, sum over the different particles. Okay, so I hope by now I have convinced you that um, the, the, let's say, the ubiquity of this um, Feynman-Vernon or caldera legged model for describing open quantum systems. And why is this interesting is because um, this actually helps us to characterize quite easily the environment in order to tackle the open system dynamics. And this is what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. This is kind of a little bit of a mathematical slide, but we will go through it and, and emphasize uh, the physical concepts. So remember this uh, reduced density matrix that was uh, actually, well, that we could express in terms of a dynamical map. Well, it turns out that, of course, this corresponds to a trace over the environment degrees of freedom of the time evolved initial state which we, I remind you, were assuming to be at the correlated state between the system and the environment. And now, of course, this guy here, this unitary evolution operator, is an evolution operator with respect to the full Hamiltonian of the system and the environment. It's a kind of an ugly object, which we can nonetheless, just to let you know the following concept, not, uh, or it's not an operationally a uh, reasonable thing to do, but just for you to fix the, the following concept, we um, express in terms of a Dyson expansion. And as it turns out, when we plug this Dyson expansion here and here, and we trace over the environment, and we consider this particular form for the interaction Hamiltonian, um, you will see that the reduced density matrix depends on different moments of or different fluctuations of the coupling operator of the environment of B with respect to the initial state of the environment. This is kind of a funny thing. Uh, I remind you that these Bs are time evolving with respect to uh, H0, which is just the free part of the Hamiltonian. And the idea that I want you to take into account here is the following, is that mathematically we can see that the reduced density matrix of the system will entirely depend on environment fluctuations or different moments of the environment fluctuations with respect to the environment initial state or equilibrium state. This is kind of funny because um, somehow what we care about to describe the open quantum system when it comes about describing the action of the environment into this quantum open system is how is the environment being altered with respect to its equilibrium state? How does it fluctuate with respect to its equilibrium state? And now you tell me, okay, this is very abstract. Uh, what is the use of this? And um, well, um, this connects with this concept of statistics that I'm going to, to, to discuss uh, in the next slide. So as it turns out, uh, there are two different families of environment. And this connects a little bit with what you know from the central limit uh, theorem, as you will see in the following. In particular, <laughs> it's very easy. There are environments that are statistically Gaussian and environments which are statistically non-Gaussian. But what does it mean is the following. In particular, Gaussian environments are those guys, so are environments composed by harmonic oscillators as all these examples, as I was showing you before. Um, and they are therefore composed of a collection of harmonic oscillators. Um, again, back from the ideas of Feynman and Vernon. Moreover, these harmonic oscillators can be of bosonic type, like for instance, uh, phonons or photons. 
But by the way, they can also be of fermionic type. You may also think about an environment that is harmonic, is composed by, a, for instance, a gas of, a, of free electrons. Like a, when you are thinking about a transistor, um, where you have some, some uh, well, some, some switch in the middle uh, of two electronic leads, and it turns out that these electronic leads are very well described as a collection of free fermions. So this is also a type of harmonic oscillator environment, uh, which, uh, which is, uh, well, which corresponds to, to fermions. And why are they Gaussian is, um, well, um, because besides having a quadratic type of Hamiltonian that describes this collection of free, non-interacting um, oscillators, the coupling operator of the system, uh, of, of the environment with the system, this B, is actually composed of a linear, uh, of a sum of linear terms that are linear combination of creation and annihilation operators. This is happening in all the examples I was showing you before, and is the most common situation. Um, this condition here, having this particular coupling, is very crucial to preserve Gaussian statistics, which I will show you what it actually means in, in the next few minutes. But interestingly is to say that, uh, well, we will probably not have time to, to extend too much today on this concept, but it's very important that the diagonal terms of, the, um, of each of these B lambda operators between eigenstates of the environment is zero. And this is connected to the fact that the uh, second order moment um, of these fluctuations will actually decay in time. But let me uh, skip a little bit this idea, which is a little bit more advanced, and let you know that precisely these Gaussian environments um, have the property that among all these fluctuations that, uh, let me go back uh, a minute, these uh, uh, different order uh, fluctuations, only the, all of them can be actually expressed in terms of second order uh, fluctuations. So this is what it means to have a Gaussian environment is actually to say that higher order moments or higher um, L uh, fluctuations can actually be rewritten in terms of L equal to two, in terms of uh, second order moments of these uh, fluctuations. So it's kind of a very nice statistical property by which we know that each of these terms that are key to describe the reduced density operator can be described in terms of second order moments only. And by the way, odd Ls, so fluctuations that contain an odd number of B operators are zero. This is, uh, this is also linked to having a Gaussian type of environment. And because of this, um, we can actually say that all these Gaussian environments can be entirely described through this function. This means Forget about all the rest. This means that if you experimentally have access to this function here, in principle, that's all I need to be able to describe the open system dynamics. This is kind of a very, very powerful result that emerges from having this microscopic description of the environment and of the coupling between the environment and the system. And let me go a little bit more detail how does this uh, correlation function looks like. Because as it turns out, it looks uh, for an environment which is initially in an equilibrium thermal state, namely it has a fixed temperature, it's in the Gibbs state corresponding to a fixed temperature, um, well beta is uh, actually the inverse of such fixed temperature. So it can be written in this form, this is a, the most general form for the correlation function of a Gaussian bath or a harmonic bath that is in a thermal state. And it comes in terms of this function here, this spectral density, which is actually what people measure experimentally. So people experimentally have access to this spectral uh, information 
of, of the environment, or it's also sometimes called noise spectrum. And um, also in the 80s, but this has been a model that has been used again and again, uh, Caldera and Leggett were saying, okay, even if we don't have uh, access experimentally to the exact form of this guy, what we can do is we can classify environments um, in, in different, uh, well, we can classify them with a particular phenomenological form of this spectral density. And each type of environment will correspond to a particular power law for, uh, for omega. So this means that depending on whether we have phonons, photons, phonons living in a two-dimensional material, uh, uh, photons uh, living in three dimensions, two dimensions, etc. The only thing that we have to care about with this Caldera and Leggett phenomenological model for the spectral density is to fix the corresponding S. And this is a kind of a very powerful result because uh, this tells you, okay, we are still thinking about universality classes, right? So we are saying, first of all, we are saying no matter how complex our environment is, we can assume that it has Gaussian statistics and therefore it can be entirely described, its action on the system can be entirely described through this function. And secondly, this function which depends on another one which is called the spectral density can be modeled uh, with a sort of a universal uh, phenomenological uh, form. Um, and then there is some microscopic derivation for J omega, which I'll, I will explain in, in a minute. But let me tell you a couple of things more about uh, this caldera legged model, and also introduce you some concepts that are related to the correlation function. So any questions so far? I'm still going very fast. Yes, no? Okay, fine, better. I'm still speaking fast because, you know, Spanish people speak fast, so it's something. <laughs> but I'm trying to emphasize more things. And, okay. Um, good. So at, uh, let me finish a couple of things that then we make a small. Yes? By, could you please uh, speak? Second order correlation? Yes. Fluctuation. So this is exactly this function. This is a, a fluctuation of, a, uh, well, this is a, a function that describes a fluctuation of the environment around its initial state. This is um, the, well, if you, let me explain it in a different way. If you solve, if you solve the dynamics of the open quantum system, for instance, the qubit, and you uh, imagine that you extract the, um, the master equation that describes the evolution of the reduced density matrix of the qubit, what you will find out is that the coefficients of this, uh, or of this uh, master equation will entirely depend on this function. This is what I was meaning. So this function is the only quantity from the environment that is coming into play in the evolution equations of the open system. And you can call it fluctuation, you can call it correlation function. The important thing is that you don't need anything else from the environment. You don't need any other information from the environment. Okay, so, um, so did I answer the question or? Okay. So, and of course, depending on the S index uh, that you choose in the caldera legged model for the spectral density, the resulting correlation function will uh, behave differently in time. And in particular, it will have a different so-called correlation time. As we will see later, this correlation time, it's going to be very important quantity because it will describe uh, roughly speaking, because it's, uh, it's kind of still an approximated idea, it will roughly speaking describe how long does the environment take to recover from the interaction with the system, or how, much the, how long does the environment take to bounce back to its equilibrium state. 
Um, this is why, well, this connects to the concept of fluctuation. So the environment, when coupled to the system, will uh, it was initially in an equilibrium state, but now it's coupled to the system, and it will be moved out of its equilibrium um, for, for a certain time, which is related to this decay time of the correlation function, and then bounce back, hopefully, to its equilibrium state. And I say hopefully because this is not always the case, in particular when you are at the strong couplings. But we are now, yes? Right, yes, yes, exactly. More or less this time will tell you the time scale in which the system and the environment will become correlated. And, um, and, and somehow when I'm talking about correlation time, uh, well, the, first of all, the fact that this function decays to zero is telling you that somehow there will be some, uh, well, the environment will, will be um, recovering from the interaction with the system. So we'll go back to some kind of equilibrium after it, after it. It is not always the case that the correlation function decays to zero, as you will see later. Yes? Yes? Oh, sorry, yes, no, I, I, you didn't miss anything. I didn't say it. So this corresponds to the real part and the, and the green line corresponds to the imaginary part. Which, yes, please. I'm gonna approach to you because, uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed, it's, it's connected very well. It's connected to, uh, so during this time, uh, there will be chances, but not always it will be the case, but uh, there will be some chance for having a backflow of information from the environment to the system. Yes, yes, exactly, just during this time. This is the time in which uh, these guys may become correlated either classically or quantum mechanically. And, and, and moreover, not only they will be correlated, but also uh, it might be the case that some of the information that the open system have lost into the environment will come back to it. Exactly, very well. Good, so, and by the way, uh, the fact that there is an imaginary part in the correlation function is telling you that the, um, I mean, it is telling you that the environment is quantum mechanical. If we had a classical environment, um, this, uh, the, let's say the imaginary part will be negligible. One way to reach the classical limit is by increasing the temperature. There should be one parenthesis here, <laughs> sorry. There should be the hyperbolic cosine it's growing with the temperature. So this means that when the temperature is, is higher and higher, the real part of the correlation function is going to be much more relevant than the imaginary part. And this means that we will have a real correlation function mostly. And uh, well, we have uh, therefore our whole theory um, can be a theory in which we can assume that the environment is classical because classical environments have a, a correlation function that is real, right? But this is a side remark, so please, yes. Sure, yes. I don't know if I know by heart. Okay, let's see. Uh, omic environments, um, uh, a ver, let, let me start with uh, subomic environments are those that are, for instance, correspond to when you have the electromagnetic field, right, confined in a particular, uh, in a particular architecture, in a particular material, like, for instance, a photonic crystal. We will see later on. Um, a photonic crystal is a material which is uh, periodic in the refractive index. This means that there will be some frequencies uh, of the electromagnetic field that will be scattered out of this material, will not appear in the material. And as a result of this, uh, the um, spectral density of the electromagnetic field, which in the vacuum without the material uh, is, uh, scales like om super omic, omega uh, to the cube, in a photonic crystal it can scale like omega over one half. So this is one example. And then, uh, I, uh, the different, uh, so what I can tell you is that these 
um, S, that, that is in the power of omega, for instance, when you are talking about phonons, will correspond to, so different values of S will correspond to the phonons in the material. Now I'm jumping into the case of a phononic, uh, phononic environment. Uh, will correspond to phonons being encapsulated or existing in or corresponding to vibrations of a materials of different dimensionality. So this S will grow with the dimensionality of, of the material uh, that is vibrating. Um, I've also read that some values of S correspond to fractal environments. So environments that have uh, some dimensionality that is fractal-like. So it's, it's, a, it's a very nice question. And uh, um, well, these are just a few examples uh, to, to let you know that uh, we can discuss later. But indeed, they really correspond to different physical situations. And as I said, in the case of phonons, it corresponds to different dimensionalities of, of the material. OK, so. And, uh, but okay, this is a phenomenological approach to access this spectral density. Uh, we can think about micro microscopic uh, derivations of such a correlation function directly when we are uh, when we know a little bit more the coefficients of the uh, of the Hamiltonian. Let me explain this a little bit more. Mm, hopefully, not jumping too much. So this correlation function uh, for zero temperature, for instance, but uh, well, for finite temperature, as we saw before, it can be written in both cases in terms of remembering the Hamiltonian, uh, there were some coupling strengths that were tuning the coupling between the open system and each of the K or lambda harmonic oscillators. So these are coming into play in the correlation function. And then this omega K corresponds to the uh, dispersion relation of, of the field. So this, uh, remember this uh, Hamiltonian that we had, um, I don't know if there is, we have some chalks here. So we have HB being a sum in K of omega K, BK dagger, BK. And then the interaction part was a sum in K of GK of um, BK, plus BK dagger times some coupling operator of the system, OK? So as you can see, these two quantities, omega k and gk, are those that come into play in the correlation function. And of course, there are cases in which we have, uh, well, we have knowledge of this dispersion, and we have more or less knowledge of these coupling operators. Uh, so not coupling operators, but coupling strengths. And um, well, for instance, when we talk about the light matter interaction, we know with the dipolar approximation what the form of this uh, GKs uh, is. And what we know is that, uh, for instance, when the light is not confined, so the electromagnetic field is in the vacuum, um, well, you know that uh, actually the, um, well, this uh, function is going to be um, in particular, this, uh, well, the density of states, which is one of the components of the spectral density, is going to be smoothly growing with frequency. Um, so this means, all in all, that when you calculate for this particular case the correlation function, it will decay very, very fast. And this is how in quantum optics, in most of the situations of quantum optics, we will have that the electromagnetic field, when interacting with an atom, in the sense of, for instance, exchanging a photon with the atom, will recover instantaneously. What physically, the picture that you should have physically is that you have an atom that is now in the middle of the space, and it's now emitting a photon, and this photon will never ever go back to the atom, right? Because it will immediately uh, get lost. So there, are, there is no back action from the environment to the system. There is no backflow of information. Or to say it in different words, the correlation, fun the correlation time or the decay of this second order moment or this fluctuation will be uh, very, 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 very fast as compared to the evolution of the system. And, uh, but the, this is just one example 
of the many because now imagine, uh, as I said before, that you confine the electromagnetic field into a photonic crystal. Remember the photonic crystal was this periodic structure in the refractive index, which is kind of a, a, the light equivalent of a, of a um, semiconductor in the sense that you have a periodicity but not in the potential for the electrons, but in the refractive index, which is what the light sees. It's kind of the potential for the light if you want. And because of this periodicity, you will have um, some Bragg scattering of uh, the light outside of the crystal uh, for those wavelengths of the light that are related to the periodicity of the material. And because of this Bragg scattering of this particular uh, range of frequencies uh, related to the periodicity, you will have a gap being formed in the density of states. Before, the density of states in the vacuum was grown with omega square, but now it kind of look, look, look pretty ugly because you will see that it presents a gap. So this means that when these materials were discovered by, by Sajeb John in, in Toronto, in Canada, um, back in the, I think it was in the 90s, they were saying, look, these materials have a vacuum that is more empty than the vacuum because um, if you think about the vacuum, there, are, there is always density of states around. There are always modes that are available to receive photons, like empty vessels. Even if there are no photons in the field, there is always the possibility of having them because you have the, part the modes, the density of states, the vessels for, for, for receiving or creating photons. But here, you really have a gap of frequencies or a range of frequencies where no photons are allowed. And now it turns out that when you couple a two-level atom with a frequency that is uh, either in this band of allowed frequencies or in the gap, uh, it, will have, it will suffer a strongly non-Markovian effect. And why? Because if I calculate the dynamical equations of the atom, and I told you before that uh, such, uh, well, we focus on just one band. We could also consider this other one. But if I calculate the dynamical equations of the atoms, and remember that I told you before that these dynamical equations are going to be, this is for zero temperature, are going to be entirely determined by the second order moment or correlation function. It turns out that for this particular uh, um, uh, density of states, this function will decay very, very slowly. It will decay polynomially in time. So this means that such type of environments will be strongly non-Markovian, will recover very, very poorly from interacting with the system. And actually, it's kind of funny because uh, we will not have time today to discuss about this, but if I locate the atomic frequency here in the band gap H or very, very close to it, um, this will be so extreme that there will be a bound state being created between the photon and the atom. So there will be an entangled state. So imagine how far we are from having an environment that bounces back to the vacuum, equilibrium state, that after interacting with the system, you will, the environment will actually not only not relax back to its initial state, but create an entangled state between the, uh, the photons and, and the atoms. So it, it will be, um, well, it's a very extreme case of having non-Markovian dynamics. Well, just to give you a few I, a flavor of how you model this uh, correlation function, uh, it's actually by uh, thinking about the fact that uh, you know that the dispersion for these particular materials, by the way, also when you have an atom that is uh, coupled to the one-dimensional field in a waveguide, this is, I think, one of my last slides before the, the pause because I see people are already a bit tired. So, by the way, this is also the dispersion relation of the light when it's confined to a one-dimensional waveguide. So this is kind of funny, right? Because that, such a different structures, and still the light will have the same dispersion relation, which is tight binding type. And this tight binding type of dispersion relation will reflect precisely uh, this band gap structure that we saw before. Uh, when, uh, when plotting the uh, density of states. And this is simply because the density of states is, uh, in this particular case, 
related to the derivative of the uh, spectral density of the dispersion relation. So the density of states is uh, related to um, the derivative minus one of the uh, evaluated, of course, of, uh, at k of omega, if you like. It's a little bit uh, just to let you know that both uh, quantities are connected to each other, right? Before we saw a density of a state that had a gap, and this is emerging from the fact that the dispersion relation of the light has also a gap, uh, a gap uh, of frequencies that are not allowed, and it also has a, a band. And um, okay, and well, when you uh, work out this dispersion relation that is cosine-like, this is just the Hamiltonian of an atom coupled to such electromagnetic field with this particular dispersion relation and this coupling Hamiltonian, which is corresponding to light matter interaction. Uh, it turns out that it really, I mean, you can really solve in the continuum limit, and now this depends on the spectral density, the density of states. Um, um, well, you can really solve this integral, and it gives you, uh, as a solution, a Bessel function that at long times, you know, it decays like 1 over square root of t. So this is, again, what I was expressing before, the fact that we have a very, very um, slow recovering of the environment from the interaction with the system. Um, I think this is a very good moment to, to start for, let's say, 10 minutes or so. I think everyone will be happy about this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>